And I'm here in my BBG capacity, not my Hudson capacity, but, I'm, but I wear both hats because the uh, Broadcasting Board of Governors is a, a board of uh, presidential appointments, a board that uh, confirmed by the U.S. Senate of um, people uh, who uh, oversee U.S. government international civilian media, which yeah, I'll go a little bit into what that means. But I, I'm so. Uh, all of us on the board, and the, the board is chaired by uh, Jeff Schell, who is an incredible individual who is the CEO of Universal Film Properties, Universal Pictures, uh, and uh, some of the notable board members include uh, Ryan Crocker, who was, the US, who was probably the most distinguished U.S. diplomat uh, uh, of the last half century, who was U.S. ambassador to both Iraq and Afghanistan um, in the last uh, decade or so, and so it's a, it's a board of... Uh, people who are deeply concerned about uh, U.S. Uh, public diplomacy, about the, the U.S.'s image abroad, about the way that we communicate with, uh, with uh, people in, in, un in societies that are not free. And so, uh, so all of us who serve on the board and we meet, though it is a, it is a part-time responsibility, it, is, it takes a significant amount of time. We meet uh, uh, normally about once, once a month for a day to a day and a half to discuss uh, matters. So it's a, it's a, and and it's it's been, it's been a quite, it's been a great honor to serve, and it's been, uh, it's, and I've learned a great deal in my short term of service on the board. So I'm I'm here today to talk about U.S. government, civilian international media in what's a rapidly changing geopolitical climate and a rapidly changing media environment. And now I, I think back to my days. Uh, I was born in 1961. I grew up, I was a ham radio operator, I was a shortwave buff, as probably a number of you were. Think back to uh, the old days of the Cold War, when uh, there was Voice of America, there was the BBC, uh, there was Radio Moscow, uh, and it was, it was, the, the world was fairly clearly divided. You knew who you could trust, you knew who you could believe, and uh, even though the Soviets spent a, and their allies spent a significant amount of time trying to propagate their ideas, their efforts didn't go terribly far. Uh, the BBC, and, and in particular Voice of American Radio Free Europe, really were critical to the dissemination of the ideas of truth and liberty and to propagating Western culture behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and if you talk to the great heroes of uh, the Cold War, the, 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 dis the dissidents, whether it was Václav Havel, uh, whether it, uh, in particular, or you talk to uh, any, any of the uh, Polish uh, uh, dissidents who talk to Lech Walesa, they will tell you about the time they would sit in their homes listening to Radio Free Europe, the Voice of America, listening to the wonderful jazz broadcasts, listening to the news, uh, hearing about the Soviet invasion of their country, and. Uh, uh, and, and, and what that meant to them, and how, what, what a great source of strength it was that they knew that there was some place in the world that lived in truth and that could broadcast truth. Uh, but we live in a very different, a radically different uh, media environment today. Uh, to begin with, Western culture is, is virtually omnipresent around the globe. There is no Iron Curtain, uh, whether it be rock music, Hollywood, reality television, you know, just about everywhere with the exception of uh, North Korea. And the proliferation of cable news outlets and the rise of the internet also means that Western news is available throughout the world, whether it be the BBC, CNN, to people going online to look at the New York Times, uh, the Drudge Report, Time Magazine, other outlets. So what, what, what is the BBG and why is it needed? So the, the Broadcasting Board of Governors is an agency of the federal government. We have an annual budget of $721 million, five major networks. The Voice of America, which is our major network, which reports on the U.S. to a world audience and does uh, reporting on world events. Then we have our surrogate broadcasters, and these 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 broadcasters broadcast to places that are that are. And the Voice of America primarily broadcasts to countries that are not altogether free, not altogether stable. Uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which focuses primarily on Russia, Central Asia as well as Afghanistan and Iran, Radio Free Asia, which is heard from China to North Korea to Vietnam and Cambodia, and Al Hura Media Middle East Broadcasting, which was set up after 9-11, which covers the 22 nations of the Arab world and the Maghreb. The Broadcasting Board of Governors was set up as an institution in sort of the, 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 great, in the great days of uh, glory 
post-Cold War triumphalism, uh, uh, when there was a sense that uh, the public diplomacy role that had been played by an agency called the U.S. International U.S. Information Agency, which was a sort of which was a separate bureau of our Foreign Service, essentially dedicated to propagating American ideas, American values around the world, that it was time to close that agency in the aftermath of the Cold War, and so. Uh, we took over some of the role that, uh, that uh, the uh, U.S. Information Agency did with far less money. Now, actually, we, we have this, we have on average over 200 million uh, listeners and viewers each week who tune into our, our programs, whether it be 25% of uh, adult Iranians who watch VOA Persia via satellite in Iran, uh, to North Koreans who literally risk their lives in order to listen to our programming. Uh, about their country, uh, to the heroes of Maidan, who drew upon Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty for impartial news about their country, and who used Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty to spread information about what was going on, uh, to the Al Hura 7 p.m. newscast in Iraq, which even today is the market leader with a 20% with audience there. In addition, we broadcast to Cuba via radio, via Marti TV and radio. A lot of our, our efforts are jammed, but we are increasingly finding new ways to get into Cuba to get information into that island. We face a very competitive media landscape in which audiences are bombarded with options, uh, even though freedom of information is increasingly under threat around the globe. And we're also seeing, as we discussed uh, just before we had a little gathering before, a changing strategic environment in which major world players such as China and Russia are seeking influence through massive investments in their own news networks that have the appearance of impartial news outlets. CCTV and RTV are readily available in the US, in Europe, even in Africa, which I just visited uh, for the BBG, along with regional powers like Qatar, which plays a significant role in global affairs, as we all know, through uh, Al Jazeera TV. Now, the expenses and the resources that these networks have each of them dwarf what we in, what we in the U.S. spend on our official uh, civilian uh, government international media. On top of it, the remarkable innovation and in technology that we've seen in, in, in recent uh, times from digital radio, the, the, the decline of shortwave, rise of FM, the transition to digital radio, to satellite television, to the internet, social media, to rapidly evolving mobile platforms, it's clear that we're in a very different media environment than we were just a few years ago and a very different environment we were then in the, when you think back to the heydays of this kind of broadcasting of uh, your grandparents, uh, you know, listening to shortwave on these big tube sets with uh, crackly voices and quaint uh, broadcasts uh, and the like. We've moved well beyond shortwave in most locales and we, we face very strict competition uh, for the attention of our audience from both these official outlets like uh, RTV and uh, CCTV, but we also face it from uh, commercial uh, outlets as well, um, some of whom are Americans, such as CNN. And uh, the move towards, uh, towards satellite and the move towards uh, mobile uh, has put increasing pressure uh, on us to adapt uh, to, uh, to what is a very different uh, world and what are different, very different formats for the kind of programs that we, we do. Uh, Ten years ago, mo almost you know, the overwhelming majority of our, of our programming was shortwave, and it was long format talk shows, you know, the kind of things uh, that uh, one would get from the BBC and uh, hour-long programs people would listen to, and that is not the way the world works anymore. You can't do hour-long chats. Programming has got to be, is, is much more, has become much a, a different, there's just a different pace of conversation on, on, the, on, on FM and there's a different pace of conversation that occurs on satellite television. Now, there are, just let's take a quick look at some of the approaches some other countries are taking. Uh, and here I'm dr I draw on the scholarship of Sean Powers of the University of Georgia, who's done some research for us at the Broadcasting Board of Governors, just to look at what's going on around the world with different media outlets. Qatar is, is pursuing a localization strategy through Al Jazeera. They're sending reporters around the globe to report on all sorts of conflicts in places, frankly, that most media outlets don't want to send people to because it is so dangerous. And they're developing, in Africa, they're, they're developing a real regional base of expertise that Africans are turning to, uh, uh, sometimes unaware of uh, some of the propaganda that uh, Al Jazeera is trying to do. 
Uh, China is trying to lure local audiences through China Radio International, CCTV, also with global stories that have local connections. And I was just in Senegal 10 days ago for the uh, broadcasting board, and I was amazed to see the uh, China Radio International building in Dakar, which is for Dakar a huge building. And it's, uh, th they're spending significant amount of money to get information out in Africa. Some of it is, is frankly, to their own citizens. They, they broadcast four hours a day in Chinese, because there's so many Chinese workers now in, in Senegal. There are also a significant number of Chinese workers in Ghana, where I, where I also was. The Chinese uh, seem almost omnipresent. They built and gave as a gift to the people of Ghana a new, a massive new defense ministry building. And so they're making efforts in, in trying to improve uh, their, their, their own, how they are perceived uh, in Africa uh, and elsewhere. The Russians, the Iranians are focusing on their, on, on, on their outlets. RT has uh, launched a new website. Uh, the Iran Press TV, the Iranian media outlet, is now doing Arabic programming in the, Syri in the Syrian dialect. Uh, the United, the, the major Western uh, countries that do these kind of international broadcasts, us, the French who have got uh, uh, Radio France International and uh, France 24, the Germans who have Deutsche Welle, the, the, the Brits who've got the BBC, the Japanese and the Australians, we continue to base our international, civilian international media on a commitment to freedom of expression, promotion of a global democratic public sphere, and we in the United States on our uh, civilian media outlets, uh, civilian, I'm sorry, government international media outlets, uh, government civilian international media outlets, we take a, a journalistic approach to uh, covering issues. We will present both sides of the story. So we will uh, present the story on Edward Snowden, and uh, it will be very different than the coverage you get on RTV, where uh, some of Mr. Snowden's, uh, where Mr. Snowden's disinformation will be played up and uh, they'll simply be uh, criticisms of, of the United States. Uh, we, we're, we're, we know that a healthy, the healthy debate is key to a democratic society, and we will present both sides of the story. Uh, and there's, some, there's some open question as to whether or not that actually serves our public diplomacy purposes. For example, in uh, 2009, in, uh, when the uh, Green Revolution began in, in, in Iran, our Persian media outlets uh, under directive from uh, the, the uh, Obama administration, we're told not simply to feature uh, those who were back in the Green Revolution. And so there were debates between backers of the regime and backers of the Green Revolution, which was disappointing, frankly, to some uh, who, to, to many in Iran, who hoped that we would take a more vigorous stand in favor of revolution on our, uh, uh, on VOA, which has a gigantic reach into, uh, into, into Iran. Uh, so uh, it's clear that uh, these, 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 that our global strategic competitors, Chinese, the Russians, among uh, others, see international broadcasting as key to effective power promotion abroad, that it gives them some leverage over our societies and over, over other societies. CCTV spends $2.5 billion a year annually. It's, it's the largest of any of these uh, broadcasters around the globe, and it received a $7 billion injection uh, originally to sort of get itself uh, moving uh, and to get itself much more visible. It now, CCTV reaches now over 200 million households uh, today, and as I mentioned, it was all over the place in Africa when I was there 10 days ago, and, I, and it's all over the United States, CCTV. Al Jazeera, Arabic news operation, it it continues to have a major impact uh, in its own region and elsewhere. We've obviously seen the news the last few days coming out of the Gulf, uh, of uh, ambassadors being withdrawn from Qatar and the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council being very, uh, being outright hostile to uh, the Qatari government. Uh, Al Jazeera is no longer the monopoly that it once was when it first got started and when it offered a vibrant, colorful, and often hateful alternative to the dull, state-friendly, anti-Western media that was the norm in the uh, Arab world. Uh, Al Jazeera's pro-Muslim Brotherhood agenda has been exposed, but the network is going well beyond this agenda now and has turned into more of a news agency, hiring credible <coughs> journalists. And in America, they've hired many well-known former uh, 
network correspondents to boost their brand, Al Jazeera America. And as I mentioned, in Africa, they're hiring local reporters to cover stories that don't get coverage in other international outlets. They're launching a UK-specific channel shortly. They're launching a, a Turkish channel in the next 18 months, and they're significantly increasing their spending in the United States. RT, which is Russian television I know in Washington, it's carried on in both English and Spanish on, uh, on our cable system in Washington. It's, uh, it's carried to 630 million households in over 100 countries, 230 cable operators, uh, and it's largely Russian propaganda, but not simply. For RT, uh, has very biased reporting. We are talking earlier, uh, any coverage of the uh, Snowden case, they will bring on the most vociferous critics of the United States. They will bring on people who are, uh, you know, in the, in the days of the Soviet Union, we call them useful idiots, uh, people who, were, who were, uh, uh, may not be realizing the damage that they are doing to the United States with some of the stands that they, that they hold, uh, and some people who are, you know, people who were more mainstream, but who are uh, definitely uh, critical of uh, of uh, any uh, of any projection of U.S. power or any or of, of U.S. Uh, intelligence uh, capabilities. Uh, but they've also hired. They recently hired Larry King, who was at one point the king of primetime uh, cable uh, coverage in the United States. He had this program, uh, Larry King Live, which was on for three decades on CNN at 9 p.m. That was a staple. Uh, in many homes for many for many decades, and so he's now on RT. Uh, the other day, RT received a bit of an embarrassment when an, when an anchor resigned on air because of uh, shoddy coverage she and distorted coverage she felt over the situation in the Crimea, which was an embarrassment to uh, to RT. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think all these outlets uh, they're they're trying to feel their way, and like as just as Al Jazeera has has modified how it covers things. Uh, so RT has, has begun to modify, uh, we'll, we'll modify how it covers things, it'll become a more subtle instrument over time. Same thing with CCTV as they try to keep audiences in Western democratic countries and as they try to keep audiences uh, in, uh, in less free societies. Uh, so uh, we at the BBG, in the face of this uh, very changing uh, environment in which there's a lot of money going in, in which there's obviously a a very dramatic geopolitical uh, context that is rapidly changing with uh, major threats and major issues constantly uh, on the agenda. Uh, we're primarily about serious news, so we report on civil unrest, we report on natural disasters, human rights abuses, politics, the global economy, and so forth. And we're, we're not simply as we were, we're not largely as we were a tool of American public diplomacy, which we were during the Cold War. Uh, for better or for worse, and there's, a, there's an author named Martha Bales who's just written a, a new book on this subject, there's a journalistic culture that's arisen in, in the United States and in the media, and it's one that arose really in the uh, Watergate period of uh, uh, some skeptic, of deep skepticism towards government, and, uh, in this, and, and, and I think the BBG is definitely a lot of our journalists who are mainstream professional journalists who have been Many of them have served with the major networks and major media outlets. They share some of this uh, view, and so they, they, they partake of this culture, and so they, they believe that uh, fair journalism requires presentation of both viewpoints, uh, for better or for worse. And so that this, 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 I think this, this, this way of presenting the news has many strengths. I think it, it has some shortcomings as well, but that is the way that we cover the news. We try to be fair and balanced, and as fair and as balanced as we possibly can be. But we also are about trying to use every possible means we can to get credible information to audiences who are denied press freedom. We have 4,000 journalists uh, working worldwide with us on our five major networks, and we're broadcasters in the, in the broadest possible sense. We're on TV, radio, laptops, mobile devices in more than 100 countries, bringing news and information to audiences in 61 different languages. Our largest audiences are in countries you might not expect. In Indonesia, we have 21 million. In Nigeria, over 20 million. Mexico, almost 15 million. Iran, 14 and a half million. And in, in, in all these countries, we've made major strides in innovative delivery, including using affiliates sometimes to get our news out, using SMS mobile distribution for breaking news, uh, and uh, moving as well to uh, other forms of uh, getting the news out as need be. 
In a lot of countries, we are news leaders. We cover stories that aren't covered uh, in environments that lack press freedom. And this is particularly in Asia and uh, Central Asia, uh, Russia, and uh, the still unfree parts of uh, the former Soviet Union. Uh, places that, uh, and our, our media coverage is frequently cited by major media outlets around the world because we bra our reporters break stories. They break stories on the ground constantly. Uh, and, it's, and so by exemplifying a free media and free expression, we try to help foster and sustain free and democratic societies. Now, the audiences may have access to more media than ever before, but limits on press freedom and objectivity play an important role for our networks. Uh, in the Middle East, for example, TV stations, even today, uh, with longevity, are funded by, by wealthy patrons who skew editorial lines. Even in, today in Egypt, four of the most popular local TV stations, people who attract between, between half to two-thirds of Egyptians weekly, are owned by individuals with ties to the former Mubarak regime. In Iraq, the abundance of political funding for media outlets, the dearth of commercial advertising makes it very unlikely for non-state media to become editorial independent. And that's why we have, I think that's one of the reasons for the strength of our al Hura channel in Iraq where we, as I mentioned, we have a fifth of the viewers every night for our 7 p.m. news, which is the place if you're a politician in Iraq and you want to make a statement, you want to reach a broad audience, you go to al Hura. Now, social media does provide alternatives, but many people outside the Gulf don't really have access to it. For example, in Egypt, only 17% of, of the population turns to the internet for news each week. It's 48% in Saudi Arabia. And obviously, media norms differ around the globe uh, significantly from what we're used to at home. And you, you just, to us in the United States, as, as you here in Ireland, there's nothing more important than freedom of expression, the ability to speak your mind freely, is a core principle of American journalism, American democracy, uh, and we will we will use this core principle uh, at times to uh, uh, to show uh, to shape our programming and to try to teach people about uh, how democracy works and how uh, and how uh, free discussion is, is, is helpful to uh, to civil society. Now, there are obviously significant challenges our journalists face. Uh, censorship is one of them. Uh, threats of uh, detainment and bodily harm as well are quite common. I, I think of the immense courage of our stringers in North Korea who risk their lives daily to report for RFA and there are incredible people on the ground there who people will pick up a phone to call in a story which is an amazing thing uh, there. One of our journalists in uh, Syria, uh, Bashar Fahmy, was reporting from Aleppo in August 2012. He and three other journalists uh, he was traveling with were caught in a crossfire. One of those journalists was killed. Another one was kept in prison for three months. We still don't know what happened to Bashar Fahmy uh, after he was separated from his cameraman in that firefight. He's not been heard from since. We, we fear the worst, uh, but we don't know for sure. Uh, one of our reporters in Azerbaijan is now facing an ongoing smear campaign and criminal charges on the heels of her coverage, investigative coverage of high-level corruption. Several of our reporters who were in Maidan uh, were beaten bloody as they covered uh, the disobedience in, in the Ukraine. David Satter, who is an investigative journalist uh, working uh, for RFERL and a Putin critic who also happens to be a Hudson Institute colleague, was recently expelled from Russia. Uh, and he is an, he's, he's an investigative journalist. He's looking at corruption. He's looking at all sorts of underground ties in Russia. He was the first American reporter to be expelled from Russia since the end of the Cold War. So our journalists face deep and uh, significant uh, challenges. But even so, even with these challenges, uh, we, we continue to do some very, very important, very critical work uh, that, frankly, is, is irreplaceable. Uh, in Iran, as I mentioned, uh, our media reaches more people each week uh, through television, radio, and the internet than does the BBC. Heard a very moving story a couple of weeks back. I had breakfast with a with a man who's a political scientist in Washington who occasionally goes on the uh, VOA purchase service for programs that discuss democracy. And he, he's, he, he's a political theorist by training, and he uh, was in, would go on, talk about separation of powers, talk about how Congress functions, talk about congressional committees' investigations, 
how uh, the White House operates. And he had gone to uh, Cyprus on vacation last summer. And before he went, he, he grew a beard because he knew that he, he might be recognized there because there are a lot of Iranians in, in this is in the, in the Turkish part of uh, Cyprus. So he, he, he was there with his wife and kids and he goes off to a, uh, to a, to, he goes into a Turkish bath there and he starts talking to someone. And the man says, after hearing him for a couple of minutes, he goes, I know who you are. And he goes, no, you don't. No. And then a couple of minutes later, he goes, I know exactly who you are. You're that guy who's on the VOA Persia TV program. You talk about the rule of law. You talk about uh, congressional elections. The guy was, he was flabbergasted. He then, that evening, he went to dinner in, in, the, in the hotel, a resort restaurant, sitting on the beach. And buffet, he sits down with his family. All of a sudden, within two minutes, a massive line of about 40 people forms to talk to him. Why? Because people wanted to, they wanted to engage, they wanted to ask, they were just curious about the way that uh, American constitutional democracy works. And it just shows the deep penetration that our broadcasting has and the deep impact it could uh, uh, potentially have. Now, the Iranians try to block our, 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 our broadcast via localized jamming, but uh, many Iranians are very resourceful. They use web censorship uh, circumvention tools as well as hidden satellite dishes in order to stay connected to the world. Uh, we, elsewhere in the Middle East, we, we, we have uh, Radio Sawa, our, 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 our radio program. We do a 20-minute uh, uh, weekly program, Free Zone, which covers elections, women's rights, and freedom of the press. And it's, it's very important talking about women's rights because a lot of uh, the, the broadcasting, the state-owned broadcasting, even in the countries we reach, and the other kinds of uh, media outlets that go into these countries, uh, particularly in the uh, Muslim world, uh, tend not to have a tend not to focus on women's rights, tend not to give, uh, encourage women to think of themselves as having rights and uh, uh, the right to make up their minds on critical issues. And so this, this program, Free Zone, is the only Arab language uh, radio program broadcast in the, region, in the region on freedom and democracy. Now, local content does matter in this marketplace. Uh, and we've, for years, Voice of America, we've done our best when there's dedicated local news and information. Uh, even when there, there, there are uh, very strict uh, limitations to resources. In China, we've been at the forefront of reporting breaking news and exclusive stories from inside the country. Radio Free Asia was the first to report on the many of the 125 self-immolations of Tibetans who were protesting Beijing's rule. And we remain really the definitive source of information uh, in Tibet. Uh, and our, our programming, including the documentary we did, Fire in the Land of Snow, Self-Immolation in Tibet, was broadcast around the world in Mandarin, Tibetan, and in English, and ha had str uh, strikingly strong uh, viewership. Uh, local, and local content matters. I was just in Africa, and uh, as I mentioned before, I was in Ghana, and a few days before I, I arrived, there was a, a a BBC presenter, Komla Dumour, who had passed away suddenly at the age of 41. He was the host of a program on the BBC that was dedicated to news from Africa, and he was a major local celebrity. There was three days of funeral ceremonies in Accra. The uh, Ghanaian president spoke uh, about him. He was a, a, a hugely popular figure, as I mentioned, with this, uh, this uh, Persian uh, this political scientist who does VOA Persia. Our, 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 our people, our personalities are well known when they go to these countries uh, if, they can, if the countries allow them in. They're also well known in the countries they're not allowed to go in. But reach doesn't tell the entire stories of uh, broadcasting impact. You know, we, we, we have to figure out a way to keep our, our viewers engaged uh, and engaged in dialogue on issues that are critical for the United States that we care about and that are critical to promoting uh, democracy. And we also have to figure out ways that we're producing content that's not available elsewhere. And, and so we, we've been, we work to uh, build awareness of US policies and support freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And so we've used, we've now moved to a US bureau model in several markets, including Indonesia, the Balkans, Turkey, Ukraine, and Latin America, where we work with affiliates to, to produce VOA, to place VOA programming on other media outlets. And so we will serve as the US bureau for uh, programs that have very large uh, viewership audiences and so we will, if a news reporter in uh, a news broadcast in Central America or South America wants to have a Washington reporter, we will give them a Washington reporter essentially free of charge and our journalists are standard trained journalists, they're not 
there to there to present both sides of the story. They're not there to present uh, uh, official U.S. government policies as such. But oftentimes, just simply presenting the news as it is is a massive improvement over what they're hearing, since uh, they're oftentimes getting a much more distorted view of uh, what we're we're talking about or what's happening in Washington. So. Uh, let me let me add that uh, we have we 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 cover U.S. policies and democratic pro democratic values through news coverage of live events, current affairs reports, through newscasts and acquired documentaries, and and it's uh, it's in, in our, our particularly in the Middle East we we become a through Al Hura and Radio Sawa we we become a venue where people go to hear their voices heard without editorial distortion. Um, we have discussion programs, magazine shows that feature people from the region in open format discussion. Uh, and uh, for example, when protesters took to the streets in Egypt uh, in July, our cameras were there interviewing people from different camps about their desires for the future of Egypt. Uh, and likewise, uh, when major news events break in the United States, Al Hura will cover these events uh, uh, as well and bring news of the United States to, to the region. And, we, and they often focus on reports of freedom of, uh, on how freedom of religion and tolerance works in the United States. There have been major stories on how Jews and Muslims have celebrated Passover together at a local mosque in Sterling, Virginia. How Christians opened up a church in uh, Burke, Virginia so that uh, Muslims would have a place to worship during uh, Ramadan. The kind of news stories that you won't get on other Middle East uh, media outlets that are trying to, sh to uh, fight uh, religious tolerance and uh, freedom of expression. And we also spend a lot of time highlighting human rights and uh, uh, freedom of uh, women uh, and the rights of women, um, challenging uh, uh, f the notion of uh, forced marriages uh, and uh, uh, focusing on uh, educational opportunities available to women uh, um, as well. I should add, one other thing we do is we spend a lot of time and a significant amount of resources in, in creating programming to teach people English. And this is something that the BBC pioneered, was immensely successful. And we're finding that there is, there is increased interest in speaking English with an American accent, and our, and our, and our uh, learning English clips are being used by many language services, including Khmer, Indonesian, Burmese, and English to Africa. Uh, so there, we do an awful lot of things. I think some of them we do very well. There are some of them that we're doing, frankly, less well, but that we're, we're, we're examining as a board and we want to sort of uh, do much better. We have a, a, a mixed bag of tools. In some places, traditional radio, including shortwave, remains strong. North Korea, Africa, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we reach 75% of the adult population. Uh, but now the use of mobile phones is growing in Afghanistan, and some 400,000 Afghans get SMS headlines from our Radio for Europe Radio Liberty service to Afghanistan. At the same time, though, we can't move entirely to SMS or to mobile platforms in Afghanistan, even if a transition were to occur, because 60% of the Afghan population is, uh, is illiterate. And so we offer an intelligence voice recognition op option to read the headlines to those who can't read it for themselves. But it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a challenge, and we need to sort of stay as technologically advanced as possible. And one of the most important technological advances that the BBG is at the forefront of is combating internet censorship. And this has, frankly, become one of the most important things we do. Uh, Congress just mandated us to spend 5% of our budget in the, uh, the new appropriation uh, for fiscal year 2015 uh, on <laughs> tools to combat internet censorship, and it's become a growing part of our budget through, we have uh, engineers who are opening the internet gateway for audiences in China, Vietnam, Iran, and many other countries around the world through constant innovation and technological evolution, and we partner with some of the biggest names in, uh, in, in technology and, and the internet uh, on these efforts. Working with tools like Ultrasurf and Siphon, uh, our internet, uh, our attempts to circumvent internet censorship have provided unfettered access to the internet to individuals throughout the world whose countries filter or outright censor internet access. Uh, and the BBG is constantly promoting new and safer versions of these tools uh, as they continue to evolve to try to get around the significant uh, firewalls 
uh, that uh, countries like China have put up where they literally have hundreds of thousands of people working to prevent their own citizens from getting uh, news and information around the world. A lot of times the, the, the services that we created create shadow IP addresses so that uh, the Chinese cannot figure out that, the, that an IP address is coming from someone in China. They think it's coming from somewhere else so they can't go out and close that uh, line as it were uh, for people trying to get news and information. But we've, we've deployed both small hardware devices, software based solutions to hundreds of locations including some of the most internet restrictive environments. Uh, and so, uh, and we, we are constantly getting reports essentially on who is looking at the internet in these countries. They basically give us an idea of what needs to be done in order to open up the internet even further to uh, some of these countries. And it's, this requires a real high level of agility. And we're, we're massively expanding these networks or these efforts to focus on mobile and satellite platforms and increase research and development. Uh, China recently, for example, targeted some of our social media activities, some of our, our, our Radio Free Asia and VOA personalities had large hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, on Facebook, and then China began targeting them, and uh, so, this, so, so, so these, those platforms became uh, essentially not usable for those individuals. So we're constantly trying to figure out ways to get around the censorship that countries are doing. This is actually, I think, at the end of the day, going to be much more effective than the uh, anti-jamming efforts we did during the Cold War, because I think that we will eventually be able to, with the right level of investment, uh, open up the internet significantly for those who wish to have uh, access to free and open democratic societies, information, and uh, news about their own societies as well. Let me just sort of conclude, I've covered an awful lot of ground, and it's been a little bit uh, scattershot, but we do an awful lot at the BBG, and it's kind of hard to encapsulate it in sort of one sort of, it's, it's, it is it's an awful lot of things we do. It doesn't sort of fit into one easy category. You know, the last few weeks I think have shown we all have learned in case we somehow forgot this, that history has not ended in any uh, meaningful way against, you know, this backdrop of a changing geostrategic environment and pressures, uh, uh, you know, from uh, Central African Republic in Mali where the BBG is, is setting up new FM transmitters to deal with the rise of... Uh, Islamic radicalism and uh, threats to uh, civil liberties and uh, the, the danger of threats to the rule of law to what's, what's gone on in the Maidan. Uh, we face dramatic changes on the technology forefront of communications. We're, you know, web censorship and circumventing it are an extension of long-standing attempts by governments around the world to control information for strategic advantage. We, we need to take the tools of the 21st century and use them to promote democracy and the rule of law. Our, our news services, we're leaders in terms of our audience reach. We play a critical role in places where people can't get information otherwise, that's fair, balance, uh, and impartial. There's a huge thirst for this information, uh, particularly in countries that have uh, corrupt uh, uh, regimes, uh, regimes that uh, take action uh, against civil liberties, crack down on, uh, on a free press. Uh, it's, it is a, uh, the mission of the BBG uh, is really, a, uh, is, is really a, an important mission. It's a, it's a fundamental mission to uh, promoting democracy, to promoting free press, uh, to promoting uh, human rights. And uh, it's inspiring to work with many of our journalists who themselves put themselves at great risk uh, in, in places from uh, Mali to northern Nigeria, Burma, Tibet, Egypt, uh, Syria. And uh, in the face of all these challenges, we're, we're trying to stay ahead of a, of, of a global competition to get the word out about uh, American democracy, about a free press, about uh, the rights of women, about human rights, and about uh, religious toleration. And it's a, it is a constant challenge uh, against a very shifting backdrop of uh, technological and geopolitical change. <laughs>